in our last video, we looked at there's two churches. This We're looking at Revelation chapter 12. One is this visible outward church that the whole world sees, but inside of this visible church, the woman is this invisible child. And the child speaks of that remnant that's going to be that end time church that's finally birthed, that those who have always been hungry for God always wished they could be a part of. And God says in Ephesians 4, I gave all these fivefold apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints until we all come into the unity of the faith, unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. And we're going to see in a few minutes why that coming into a perfect man makes no sense. There's millions of people in the church. How can it be one man? That's this final one birthed male child that is wanting to show God in the world and what he's really like. So in the years of head, she's in pain. She's got birth pain. She wants this child separated from her, like I said last time, and the child wants to get out and be free in God's spirit and be what God always intended the church to be. So the world could finally see Jesus actually is real. God has power. Right now the church is basically, it's not even, yeah, they hate the church, but more than that, it's more like disdain, don't even care. It's like it's like meaningless because there's such a lack of what they are starving for if they are open to God. So the years ahead, I believe, are going to carry a lot of pain that will keep accelerating within the church. And I believe there's going to be a civil war at some point in the church that's going to be brutal because families are going to separate. We don't want these kind of services. We want to go back to a nice, controlled church. We don't want all this gifts and speaking in tongues and all of this radical repentance and tears and can't we just go back and have good church and that child's going to say no I'm birthed I'm free I want to be like Jesus and so the status quo is going to come into very incredible conflict with this new new church and Mike Bickle the director of IHOP said he believed God spoke to him and said, I'm going to change the face of the whole church in one generation. And I believe that's true. And I believe it's still coming. Is that kind of change comfortable? No. No. It's going to mirror the kind of change that's going on in the world at the same time. Frantic, continual change. And, and don't underestimate, I'll just say this in passing, AI. This is not some little fad. Oh, now it's your chat GPT is going to write all this stuff. And no, no, no. Everything is going to change so radically. You and I would not recognize the world. I don't mean 20 years from now. I'm talking two, three, four years from now. You are not going to recognize the landscape of where this is going. And we're going to talk more about that later. Revelation 12.3, this great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. Why is the dragon red? Red is the color of warfare. It can be the color of blood, the blood of Christ, but it's also a warfare color and in the book of Isaiah, there's a whole passage about Christ having his whole robe splattered with blood. And we see that he treads the winepress of God's judgment in the book of Revelation. So he becomes red all over his robe. Jesus Christ is going to come as not away in the manger. He's going to come at his second coming as a powerful warrior to decimate the armies of Satan gathered to destroy Israel. 
So, but this dragon is in warfare mode. What it means is Satan and this whole world system, they are in warfare ready to go to war against those that are going to be left on earth after the rapture. And in Revelation 6, we've looked at this in the last couple of weeks in passing. It says a white horse goes out first and the one sitting on him has a bow. That's not Jesus. Jesus has a sword. This is the Antichrist. He looks white and the horse is white. Looks like Jesus. It's a counterfeit. But what follows the Antichrist going forth? The next horse is red and it says peace gets taken from the earth and it's in war. So this dragon here, all of these things are important. All these color keys, time keys, all of these things. Daniel 7. I'm going to just read it. Verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold this fourth beast. This is Daniel looking ahead from where he is. There's already been Egypt, Assyria. Don't have time to go there right now. But he's looking ahead to this final Antichrist system. That's what's being described here. Behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. And it had great iron teeth. And it devoured and broke in pieces and stomped on the residue, the rest of her children that are still left on earth, the church. And it was different from all of the beasts before. These kingdoms were powerful. I mean, they went out and conquered. But he says this one was way more powerful than any of the other world kingdoms. Hitler's going to look like a Boy Scout compared to this. I'm telling you the truth. Daniel 7, 19, a few verses later. I wanted to know. In other words, he's seeing all this. But he says, I wanted to know above everything else, what about this fourth beast? which was different from all the others. He says it again, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were iron nails of brass, which devoured and broke in pieces and stomped down everything. That's a pretty ominous picture if it's a world-encompassing government. You think we're under control. Oh, mercy. Revelation 13 verse 4 and verse 7. So they worshiped the dragon, Satan, who gave authority to this final beast, this world government. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like this ruling government, this incredible system that's now taken over the whole world? Who is able to make war with him? In other words, all of the wealth of the financiers, all of the weaponry has now been all brought into and standing behind the Antichrist. Once that warfare is subdued, that happens for him to gain control, now nobody can make war with the system because he has control of everything. See, we've always had Western nations ready to go to war and help Nazi Germany be defeated, rescue POWs, help this, provide this for this nation. Gone. There's no more light of hope of somebody to come in and help because it's total control. And you just add in AI, all the other technology, tracking, I, Every kind, now they can tell by your walk from the back and track you from satellite cameras. They don't need your eyes or a thumbprint. Oh, that's Jamie Hansen. That's how he walks. So I'm just saying, and authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. I know so many Christians that still think they're prepping and they're going to move to Montana. And they're going to hide in their little 
um, tractor trailer, 18 wheeler metal box that they buried. And they're going to have a little chimney that comes out 30 feet away and nobody's going to find them. And they're going to exist in this dark, ugly little world for what? Three months longer? Eight months longer? Not going to happen. You will not be able to buy or sell. You can't travel. You can't get on a plane. You can't buy gas. You don't give cash to somebody. It's gone. It's all gone. It's all digital. That's what the fourth industrial revolution, the Great Reset, is everything digital. Your health insurance, why I need to, I'm sick. Tell someone who cares. Show me whatever it is. I'm not trying to be emotional. This is just, I hope we get the understanding it's Jesus or nothing. It's not prepping and, and there's nothing wrong with preparing. We should, because there's going to be upheaval and it's way better to have preparation. I'm not, preparation's wonderful. Prepping is terrible because I'm going to depend on my prepping. But to have preparation is wisdom. I think you should have as much food laid aside as you can, water, purification, all of that. This could be shut down and weeks could go by when there's crisis and upheaval. It's smart to have a lot of stuff, but that's not going to be your safety. Or mine. So this red dragon that's in warfare is ready to devour he loved to kill the woman, but he's not as concerned about the visible church. He, his panic is that this new, brand new, revival-minded, passionate, believing God, new church gets traction, gets legs, gets united. People are being impacted. He wants to devour that before it's even birth. That's what he's concerned. That's what he's focused on. Revelation 12, 17, at the end of this chapter, we see this after he loses the man-child, after the man-child has this ministry on the earth that's powerful, I believe, is snatched out of his hands. Look at Revelation 12, 17. Then the dragon was enraged with the woman. That's all he's got left is those that missed the rapture. True believers that are not taken in the rapture. We're going to Spend a bit of time later proving that every which way, but loose. Um, so, well, he's enraged, but what did he do? He went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now they've gone all in. This is the church of Laodicea that was unconcerned. We're rich. We're good. And Jesus was saying, oh, you're blind. You don't even have any covering. You're so careless and sinful in your Christian life. You don't even care. And you don't have any gold. That's God himself. So now you're going to have to buy gold in the fire. And you're going to have to get a white robe under intense pressure to cover your nakedness. See, if this is an interesting study, it's almost worthless. But it has to get inside of us until, oh, this is spiritual reality in a real world. Well, it says the woman goes into the wilderness. And this is why some people think, oh, hey, he's going to protect us in Australia or Montana. Well, let's see, what is the wilderness? Is it a place? Revelation 17.3. This is why it's so important to look at each word, make sure it compares and works with everything else. This is an amazing verse to give us insight with Revelation 12. She goes into the wilderness. The dragon's coming after her. Now, in Revelation 17... 
we're seeing this picture of this false church system at the very end that's been going all down through time. This great Babylon, this woman who's like a whore, commits fornication with the kings of the earth. This spiritual system that's darkness interacts with governments and has control over the people. So the governments like it because the religion controls the people and this great whore is committing fornication with governments because both win. And if you look at nations, they always have their own religion and it's, it's protected in that nation because it keeps people under a certain control. He carried me away in the spirit into where? The wilderness. It's not a physical topographical place on the map. It's describing the atmosphere in the world at that time that's so barren spiritually, so dry, dead like a desert. And that's where this great false religious system is sitting and riding on this final government beast. And we'll see what happens to her later, that false system. So the dragon makes war with the woman in the wilderness, in this horrible world atmosphere. And this is the same beast that's at war with you and I right now. In this world that's getting more and more like a desert. Do you feel that? Not as friendly as it used to be? This is the beginnings. Revelation 6, like I mentioned, Verse 4, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it, the Antichrist, a red horse of war, to take peace off the earth, and that people should kill one another. And give, He was given a great sword, and then he sees this pale horse, and then death and famine follow that warfare. And two billion people, if it happened today, it says a quarter of the earth's population die to, to, for the Antichrist to defeat all of these competing things and finally create that system that has all authority and all power. And so it's important. These are, this isn't like your pastor going, hey, you guys believe me now. This is what my, no, this is the word of God. And, and I'm, I, I know it may seem like, well, you're always appealing to the Bible. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What do you know? <laughs> Verse 8 shows the Antichrist is given authority to kill. And it's not a time you want to just be a nice little Christian on earth. Not a friendly place. So it says that it has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon its head. I don't know if you can move ahead real quickly. Uh, could you jump to Revelation 13, 1? Now, these are things that are easy to miss. It's like, oh, who cares? Crowns him, animals, red. Who cares? This is the first verse after the completion of Revelation 12 that gives us the whole picture leading up to the rapture after the rapture, Satan cast down, gives us the whole history, and then it starts out and says, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns or diadems. Chapter 12, it only had seven. Now it has ten crowns on the ten horns. it tells us who these ten crowns are. We're going to look in just a moment. Horns represent power and authority in Scripture. I'm not going to take the time, but I'll give you these verses. Please look them up. Zechariah 1, 19 through 21, 1 Kings 20 to 11, Psalm 75, 10, Amos 6, 13. All of those show that crowns symbolize I mean, horns symbolize authority in the Bible. There's many other verses, too. So why were there only seven prior to the rapture on this beast? 
crowns, but now there's 10. We have to look at a couple of verses real quickly. Now, in Revelation 17, 12, this is after the rapture. The Antichrist system is in full swing. We're seeing this great harlot system riding on this beast. That's the Antichrist system. And what does it say in Revelation 17, 12? And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings. Now listen to this. makes no sense. And they don't have any kingdom as yet. How, do you, how, are, how can you be a king and not have a kingdom? But they are going to receive authority as kings for one hour with the beast. And again, that hour, and we'll look later, often speaks of a time period, not just an hour. Okay? There are ten powerful men on earth. Financiers, maybe technology, magnets, politicians, whoever they are. These are ten powerful men that have incredible wealth and influence and power. And they give all of it to the beast, the Antichrist, and they get to rule and reign with the Antichrist. Why were there only seven prior to the rapture, but eventually ten, as we see in chapter 13? We have to go back to Daniel, and I think this is one of the most remarkable passages that's just astonishing of how it fits. Daniel chapter 7 beginning at verse 8. I was considering the horns, and this is this last system, this fourth terrible beast. I was looking at its horns, and then another little horn came up, which is the Antichrist. And it came up among them, and before the Antichrist, three of those first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there was in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. That's the Antichrist. It said of him, he speaks great blasphemies multiple times in Daniel and Revelation. So here's what it appears. The Antichrist is one of these powerful ruling people in some way or other. And he, right in the middle of these ten powerful men, he plucks up three of them somehow by the roots, which means that sounds permanent. These guys are gone, like some kind of a political jousting going on, and they're probably against him, and they're having infighting. You know how it goes. And he prevails and gets rid of three of the ten. So let's keep reading. In verse 20... And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn that had eyes and a mouth speaking great things, whose appearance was greater than all the other ones, the other ten. The, verse 24. The ten horns, look at how perfectly God's word fits, are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom but another one, the Antichrist, in other words, they've got some kind of a major ruling body of ten powerful men that are in some way having a lot of authority setting things up. But right in the middle comes this last one, the Antichrist, and he was different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. And so in Revelation 12, Prior to the rapture, it's in that time frame where there's only seven of these men ruling, but it's a basically a world government essentially in place, but there's only seven major rulers because three of them somehow got pushed out. And I, I think this is just astonishing how God's word fits together. So it seems like by extension of logic, in Revelation 13, 1, these three kings have been replaced probably by 
men that the Antichrist has more affinity for, just like Hitler would throw down a general and put a new one in, it appears he replaces these three kings after he assumes power, after the rapture, because it goes from seven, just before the rapture, to ten, right after the rapture. Now those ten kings are in ruling authority. And the last thing we'll say here, um, I believe this ties in with 2 Thessalonians 2. We have to finish this thought and then we'll be done. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. This verse shows that the rapture will not happen until the great falling away happens and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The rapture is not going to happen until the church knows who the Antichrist actually is prior to the rapture. This is a major time key and a major knowledge key. And then it goes on and talks about he sits himself in the temple of God, showing he is God. And then it talks about this restraining force in the earth that's holding him back. And then it says they, until out of the midst, they're suddenly gone, which is the rapture. And now notice verse 8. This seems weird, like a contradiction. And then, after the rapture, will the lawless one be revealed? I thought he already was revealed in verse 3. Contradiction, God's word's false. No. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. It's not saying right then. It's saying eventually, when he comes at his second coming and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Why are there two revealings? I'll just give you my belief. I think it fits very well with everything. The Antichrist will be revealed as who he is to the church. He'll be very powerful. He'll be moving and shaking. But it's in that jockeying time politically and whatever else. And three of those kings get pushed out. And the Antichrist system is not fully united and in full power, but he's been revealed to the church prior to the rapture. Now the church, the overcoming saints, are caught out that powerful restraining force that was keeping his system from coming into full power. And now he's revealed to the world as this full, powerful system that nobody can mess with. It's a second revealing, and now there's the ten kings, and we see it in Revelation 13, 1. Seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns, ready to make war against the church that's left on earth. So we're going to have to leave it there for this time. Uh, We will pick it up. And it gets better and better as we see all of these pieces. But you cannot teach this. I can't just stand here and go, well, here's what's going to happen to him. Well, why? So you have to look. Well, there's three horns. Well, this happened. Well, there's seven. Well, there's now there's ten. If it's not explained, it's like, why should I believe that? But God's word is meticulous in giving us a picture so we know as we... We haven't seen this yet. But as these things continue to develop, we'll begin to see more and more, oh, now that's happening, now this. And that's why Jesus said, don't be upset and lose your joy and be overwhelmed as you see these things beginning to come to pass. And as the pressure mounts against the church again, that word anakupto means there's a lot of pressure on the church. You've got to stand up and not just stay under it. You've got to stand up. Remember what happened in COVID? The whole world was like, oh, what do we do? Fear. Uh, uh, uh." You've got to say, 
it doesn't matter. This is just the beginnings. <laughs> it's going to continue. So, okay, last question, class. And you know it, the answer is D, like it always is. How will we move through this time and navigate with joy and peace and not have literal heart attacks that kill men on the earth? Jesus said, it's going to get so intense, men are going to die from fear of seeing what's happening. How are you going to navigate? Because you have a good 401k, A. B, you're going to move to Montana. C, you're going to depend on your church to help you. Or D, Jesus. Jesus, always the right answer. And because this has been intense, I'll end with this. A little boy went to Sunday school, and the teacher said, you know, today we're going to learn about this amazing little animal. Oh, I mean, it's, we're going to learn about something. Sorry. And it's really cute, it's got bright, sparkly eyes, got a big, fluffy tail, loves to climb trees. It hides nuts all over. Do any of you know what that is? Tommy raised his hand. Yes, Tommy. He said, well... Sounds a lot like a squirrel, but I know the right answer is Jesus.